Have you ever questioned your personal or professional risk identification process? If not, I will give you some input how you could identify the three or even more key success factors of how to identify risks. Of course, you are the one knowing your business best, but are you also aware of your own blind spots? And as plans without actions are a waste of time, also how to implement it? Great to have you here again. Corporate integrity, fraud, non-compliance, and cybersecurity. Would you like to understand the root causes, detect threats, and take measurements to protect the most precious assets? As a leader, you need to be prepared and stay actionable in the event of an incident. Sonia Sternemann talks in her podcast, The Human Factor. Corporate integrity matters. To leaders and entrepreneurs who want to have impact, foster corporate integrity, and act as role models. As an international expert for corporate governance and integrity, entrepreneur, and independent board member, she knows the challenges. Let her inspire you. Welcome back to this new episode of the podcast, The Human Factor, Corporate Integrity Matters. You might be an entrepreneur, an integrity enthusiast, a game changer, or a business leader, or on your way there. I'm your mentor when it comes to corporate integrity and ethical leadership with impact. Founder of Corporate Integrity Concepts and the Corporate Integrity Academy. With the vision to protect and secure assets, reputation, and actionability, yours and the one of your organization. Why? Because corporate integrity matters. Let us make the world a place of corporate integrity and ethical leadership. And now let's dive into the question, how to improve the risk identification process, which is on spot for today's episode. The completeness of risk is key. And I think there aren't any business leaders or especially risk owners who wouldn't agree on that. But how does it look like when it comes to the daily business? In my experience, a completely different story. And I see a huge variety of maturity level out in the field regarding the risk identification process. For risk owners and business leaders, there is a significant potential of upside if the risk identification process serves the business needs. And what is equally important, to measure the progress. Yes, I already hear the excuses that risk never serves the business, and we will talk about excuses a little bit later. But in short, it is not a perspective I support. There are always two sides of a coin for you, also out in the field every day. How do you cope with such questions in your role and organization? There is hardly any week where I'm not involved in such questions like how to identify risks, how to measure risks, how to implement the process to identify risks, and how to make sure we understand our risks. In one of the last dis discussions, I realized again how different the perspectives and expectations are, depending on the role, depending on the industry, depending on the past experiences, and depending on how a risk owner understands his or her duty. And if I am involved in such, such conversations, I bet you are too. If my clients has these debates internally, you might have it too. Having a reliable process supports not only businesses, but also the individuals itself. This means building a solid risk identification process protects assets. And what is even more important for real leaders, it lets you allocate your resources for future growth, wealth and profit. As said, there is always a downside and an upside. The potential is, in my opinion, just underestimated. Coming back to the excuses, or in this case also named as the hindering beliefs to succeed, we all have them, sometimes more, and especially it depends on the role you currently have. Just a few examples on these different roles, and I'm pretty sure you could go on with these forever. Your peer is heading the sales department. 
he or she might think that the risk identification process is the risk management's business and not his or hers. Or your colleague, responsible for the high net worth individuals, expects that the general counsels take on the duties. Or your customer leading a mid-sized corporation tells you that she is not regulated and does not need more than they already have. What sometimes helps is to remember we do not know what we don't know. And that is one of the core messages when we identify risks. We don't know what we don't know. It also reflects what I have observed and experienced since the early 90s. Risks rapidly evolved. Risk, la risk landscapes too, but very much slower. Another area I would like you to focus on is the excuse of having too much on the table. I'm the first one exactly understanding what you are talking about. Whether you are a board member, CEO, CFO, CRO or entrepreneur, you definitely have too much on your plate. But is it worth to bet on your organizations and your future? Definitely not. And here again, for all those who do not yet know how I work, I really mean it when I say your individual future. I have seen so many, great to up to a certain point, business leaders of large corporations who ignore the price they pay for the risk of not having implemented a profound, reliable risk identification process. That is the reason why I always also outline the implications for the human behind the professional role or, pos or position. When we put the interest of having a reliable risk identification process into the big picture, there are different perspectives for that. Overall, we know that the board is responsible to oversee risks. And the board highly depends on the executive board. And as we are here talking about an iterative process of identifying the risks, which could harm our business and future, we are constantly at the beginning I remember a quote from one of my supervisors at my ver very early stages of being an auditor when we collected data. And I'm sure you know about the principle of garbage in, garbage out. It is commonly used to describe failures in human decision making due to faulty, incomplete or imprecise data. And just to tell you the story behind, the first use of the phrase has been dated to 1957 in an article about the U.S. Army mathematicians and their work with early computers. William Mellin explained that computers cannot think for themselves and that slowly programmed inputs is leading to incorrect outputs. Going from here, we all know that slowly established risk landscapes will not protect and support the business. Having all that heard now, it is time to do something and get into action. I'm going to outline three specific areas to focus on. When you are involved in the process of establishing, reviewing, challenging or approving a risk identification process. The first one is diversity. The second one, communication. And the third one, risk intelligence. We all know there are many other areas too, but having learned that we as humans are not capable of taking up much more at a time, we keep it simple, reduced to those three. Starting with diversity, I could already imagine what kind of beliefs and stereotypes might have come up while I was talking. Therefore, please let us expand diversity to much more than gender only. The first question you could reflect on is, what are the sources we use to identify potential risks for our business? Having raised this first question, I also have a subset for you to give the answers. First one, do we always use the same sources? How diverse are these sources? Did we change sources over the last ti time? How do we know that the sources used are still valid for our business? And here, please do not forget, 
that when you change your business model, and I expect most of us did that over the last 12 months, also your risk landscape should look differently. Meaning when one source was great for the last 10 years, it does not mean that it, all, it is also helpful for the future. The second question is a more internal perspective to take on. How are your communication and transportation path within the firm regarding the task of identifying risks? Also here I give you a subset. How is interaction in that process be between the board, C-level and management? How are the processes set up regarding top-down and bottom-up streams? What are the criteria for those streams? What is the cultural mindset in the risk identification process? Is the defined process still state-of-the-art or did it lose priority due to external or internal circumstances? The third question wants to learn more about the collective risk intelligence within your organization. What is the maturity level of risk intelligence as an organization? And to get clear on that, it will be necessary that the term risk intelligence is already implemented in an organization. As a starting point, and also as the take-home assignment of this episode, I would like you to observe where you can identify sort of risk intelligence within your organization. Please focus on the following three sources of risk intelligence. The individual level, the team level, and with team level I mean the board, the C-level management and the project, project teams, and the speak-up culture. With that focus, I would like to motivate you to think about the following for each of the mentioned three sources of risk intelligence. First, what can you identify? Second, what would you like to implement to change for better? And third, what do you need from others to make it even more successful? Of course, you will find the three sources and also the focus questions in the show notes afterwards. And this exercise can also be used within your organization, the team or project. You will be amazed what kind of interesting discussions start from here. And take your time to do so. It is definitely not easy to start with such kind of questions. But after several rounds, you master it. Promised. So let me quickly summarize what I talked about in a few words only. So diversity is a great source to identify risks and be careful not to limit to gender only. The communication channels and flows are important in the process. And risk intelligence measures the current level and potential to identify risks in any organization. What we haven't mentioned before, and is, it is my absolute favorite characteristic of a business leader and risk owner, is the independent mindset. You can imagine that this is the tipping point in the entire process. As a final tip, I would like to invite you to combine dem de demographic, background, gender, knowledge to identify sources of risks which could impact your business. Be radically clear about the different stakeholders involved, the communication processes you have, and the maturity level within your organization. Promote risk intelligence to your new friend and partner in crime by being a role model, shaping the culture, and impacting the future. My personal conclusion is that the risk identification process is one of the most crucial aspects for board members, C-level executives, managers and risk owners. And it is often overseen or delegated to roles which do not have enough power. Boards not taking the time to regularly talk about it will put the organization at risk, unconsciously. And as mentioned, Choose the right sources, open your mindset and search for diverse input. I promise you put your risk identification process already with these small steps to a next level. And do you remember the take-home assignment to identify sort of risk intelligence within your organization? Just in short, 
Focus on the following three sources, the individual level, the team level, and the speak-up culture. More details are in the show notes. This was episode number four of The Human Factor, Corporate Integrity Matters. Following the belief, corporate integrity secures and empowers individuals and organizations. Would you like to learn more, meet peers and getting qualified? So visit the website Corporate Integrity Concepts or Corporate Integrity Academy. Or do you think this podcast could be interesting for someone you know? Sharing is caring and we are always happy to welcome your peers to our community. And if you like this episode, subscribe and don't miss any of the future ones. The show notes are, of course, enriched with relevant information and your connection via any of the social media channels is highly appreciated and will be answered. Promised. And please do not forget, topics of your interest or interview partners are highly welcome. Just send me a note on any of the channels you know. That's it from my side. I thank you for listening. My name is Sonja Stiernimon and I'm your host. Stay curious, actionable and a role model. Take care and goodbye.